Hi everyone, this is the first video in a series of videos I'm going to make on circuit design and PCB design and assembly, uh, mostly intended for Formula student members. Um, let's get right into it. So the project I'm going to be using for this series of videos isn't in any way related to Formula Student, but the principles can still be applied. And what I want to make is a digital decimal clock. So instead of dividing the day up into hours, minutes and seconds, we divide it up into milli days and micro days. Why would anybody ever want this? I don't know, but I thought it seemed like an interesting project. So let's get right into how we would actually do this. So you can see in the top right I've put a picture of a normal decimal clock. This particular one has seconds, so it's got colons separating hours, minutes and seconds. The six is the least significant digit, and that represents one second. The least significant digit on our clock that we're going to make will represent one micro day. So let's do a bit of maths to work out how long a micro day is in units we actually understand. It's quite simple to calculate that there's 86,400 seconds in a day. So one micro day is that divided by one million, which is 86.4 milliseconds. We can take the reciprocal of that to calculate the frequency that our least significant digit will update at, and that is around 11.6 hertz. But then that raises the question, how do we generate such a weird frequency? One hertz is easy to get, but 11.6, hmm. Our circuit will contain an oscillator, which will provide the time base that everything else will be derived from. We can't buy an 11.6 hertz oscillator, and although we could make one, it wouldn't be reliable enough or stable enough to use in a clock. We will use an off-the-shelf oscillator, but it won't be at the frequency we want, so we have to come up with a way of converting that to the frequency we do want. Looking at the period that we've calculated of 86.4 milliseconds, we can see a simple way to get that would be to have a clock with a period of 100 microseconds and then simply count 864 periods of that clock. A clock with a 100 microsecond period would be of a frequency of 10 kilohertz, so that's what we need. So let's have a look online for 10 kilohertz oscillators. So here we are on RS, other suppliers are available. Let's search for oscillator. Crystal oscillator is probably what we're going to go for. And these are all weird surface mount ones. So we're going to go for mounting type, through hole, apply. I'll get rid of this in case it's upsetting it. And now we can immediately see they're all very high frequency. We wanted 10 kilohertz, and these are all in tens of megahertz. So if we click on the output frequency tab, oh, there's nothing below 1 megahertz. So it looks like we're going to have to go for a higher frequency clock and divide it down more than originally expected. But that's fine, we can do that. I particularly like the look of a 4 megahertz clock, mostly because I already have one, so then I don't have to buy one. But something like this, if you want to make this project at home, this is what you'd buy. 50 ppm, that's 50 parts per million, so you could probably run the clock for many weeks without it losing any significant amount of time. Although we'll have no idea what the time on it means anyway, so that should be fine. So for the 4 MHz frequency we're going to be going for, we're going to have to divide by 345,600. Hmm. There's several ways you could do this, but what we're going to do is use some good old-fashioned 4000 series logic chips, mostly because I have lots of them available. One type of counter chip that's very common is divide by two chips, or binary counters, ripple counters, they've got various names. This is because internally they're just a big chain of T flip-flops, meaning they're very simple and cheap to make. So let's start by dividing our 4 MHz input by 2 as many times as we can, which is 9 times. Um, 2 to the power of 9 is 512. So if we divide our 345,600 by 512, then what we end up with left is 675. Hmm. So now that we've divided by 512, we need to somehow divide the frequency that's, that we have now by 675. We can't half it anymore because 675 isn't a multiple of 2. 
So what we're going to do instead is basically just count in binary, and when the binary value equals 675, reset. So to detect 675, all we need to do is and these pins together, the divide by 1, divide by 2, divide by 32, divide by 128, and divide by 512. If we AND all of those together and feed the output of the AND gate to the reset pin of the counter, or counters as you'll see in a bit, then the counter will simply reset whenever that value is reached. We can also feed the output of that AND gate into the least significant digit, the counter for that. Hmm. So far we've just been talking about dividing by 2 and how many times we need to. Now it's time to actually look at what chips are available and how we're actually going to implement it. The two chips that I have a lot of are the 4020 and the 4024. These are both binary counters that complement each other quite well, so we're going to actually make use of one of each. The 4020 divides by more, but it doesn't give you the smallest divisions. So, for example, it has a divided by 2 output, but then 4, 8, and 16 it doesn't give you, whereas the 4024 does, but it doesn't go into as higher divisions as the 4020. The way that we're going to connect them is we're going to have our 4 MHz clock go into the 4020 and then the slowest output from the 4020 will feed the 4024 to give us the final bits that we need. Although both of these chips have lots of outputs, the only ones we're interested in are Q8, Q9 and Q13 from the 4020, Q1 and Q3 from the 4024. Hopefully this table at the bottom makes it somewhat clear why we're using those particular pins. If not, feel free to look it up yourself and figure it out. So this is a simple circuit diagram showing what our circuit looks like so far. You can see the 4020 feeding into the 4024, the two 3 input AND gates required, as the AND gate chip we're using doesn't contain a 5 input AND gate. The output of the second AND gate goes back to both reset pins and the slowest output from the 4020 feeds into the clock input of the 4024. This circuit diagram doesn't show power rails, but we'll worry about those in the next, uh, next video. The next thing we need to think about is how we're going to drive the seven segment display digits, because we have the clock to feed into the counter for our least significant digit, but beyond that, we don't know what to do. Luckily, the 4000 series in all its brilliance has a chip just for this purpose, the 4026. The 4026 simply takes a clock input and then gives you seven outputs for the seven segments. Isn't that brilliant? They've even included an overflow output that you can feed into the input of the next least significant digit, so we can just chain seven of these together. Here's the circuit diagram, now with six of the seven 4026 counters and their respective seven segment displays added. The reason there's six and not seven is because I forgot to add the 7th, but that doesn't really matter. As you can see, each 4026 feeds its respective 7 segment display with 7 resistors, for one for each of the segments. The Q10 output is, the, is what I called earlier the overflow output, feeding into the clock input of the next 4026. CE is clock enable, which is an active low input pin, so we just tie that to ground permanently to enable the clock all the time. The reset pins for now we're just going to leave grounded to. And DE is display enable, which is active high, so we tie that high. One thing to remember is that when the schematic is shown like this, the digit on the left is the least significant. So we've got to try and remember when we're doing our PCB layout to put the least significant digit on the right, otherwise the clock's going to be wrong. Another thing to mention while I remember it now is that the most significant digit on our clock is going to be counting up in days, so we will want a decimal point after that. So we need to remember to add an eighth resistor going to VCC for that for the decimal point on the most significant digit, again, once we're in KiCad. Unfortunately, this isn't quite it. There is a problem. As I just mentioned, we want the most significant digit to represent the days, and for some reason there's not 10 days in a week. So it makes sense to reset this most significant digit once it reaches 7, so that it counts the days of the week from 0 to 6. To do this, all we need to do is detect when the most significant digit is showing a 7, and reset it. To detect a 7, 
what we can do is look at the segments that are on and the ones that are off and try and come up with the simplest combination of segments that are on and off that's unique to the digit of 7. We can also cheat by using the output Q10 which is high for the first five digits and low for the second five digits which means it becomes low for the digit of 6 and then 7 which is the one we're interested in. So we're going to end it with the segment B which is the only segment that is on for 7 and not on for 6. Unfortunately, because Q10 goes low for 6 and 7 instead of going high, we have to invert it, which means we're going to need another chip just to invert that signal, which is a bit annoying. But of course the 4000 series has got our back. The 4069 is nice. exactly what we need. And in case you're wondering, the 7411 I'm mentioning is a triple 3 input AND gate, which Unfortunately, it's not 4000 series, it's 74 series, which is the successor of the 4000 series and is inferior. So here's what our circuit looks like now with the reset circuit added. You can see on the final digit in the bottom right, we have an inverter from pin Q10 using the 4069 IC. We also have output B going to the second input on our AND gate, and the output of the AND gate feeds to the reset of that digit. It doesn't matter in this diagram, but when we actually build the board, we want to tie the third input of the AND gate high, just to make sure that everything works. There is, however, one more thing to think about, which is how we set the time. At the moment, we will turn our clock on, and it will just count up. We want to be able to tell it what the time is. However, implementing this in any nice way would be difficult, and we're lazy. So all that we're going to do is add a reset button to it that resets all the digits to zero, which means, unfortunately, you have to stay up late on Sunday, but only once. Press it at midnight, and the clock will remember the time until you have a power cut. Maybe I'll make a second series of videos on a UPS for this clock. And here's our final circuit diagram. Doesn't it look beautiful? With our reset button, the logic to detect when the final digit reaches a 7, the logic to detect when the counter reaches 675, to reset, to give us our weird-ass... 11.6 Hz clock. Wonderful. And that's it. Circuit design really is as simple as that. We've now got everything in our heads ready to build it up in KiCad for the next video. Hopefully that all made sense. Feel free to leave questions in the comments if anything didn't, or message me on Teams if you're a member of the Formula Student team. Thanks for watching. Until next time, bye.